Hi, in this video I'm going to show you how to create an MQTT server and how you can use that to uh, interface different devices together to allow them to send and receive messages to each other. So on the board here I've got uh, three different devices. I've got a Raspberry Pi, I've got a Wemos uh, D1 which is running an ESP8266 chip and I've got an Arduino Uno. Now these are all running uh, puzzles which I've shown how to create in previous videos. So the Raspberry Pi uh, has got a little reed switch here. So if I take a magnet and press it up against the reed switch, you'll see the relay comes on. And if I do it again, it'll go off. Nice and easy. Okay. Uh, the Wemos, uh, this is running an RFID puzzle. So if I take an RFID tag and hold it up against the sensor, you'll see that this relay becomes activated. And the Arduino, uh, this has got a light dependent resistor here. So if I hold my hand up over the resistor and block the light, you'll see that the relay gets activated here. Now, all these puzzles are standalone. They don't need to be on a network. Uh, they don't need a server to control them or anything like that, um, which is great. But there are times when it's quite useful to actually have some kind of uh, overarching server that can monitor and remotely track either the state that the puzzle is currently in or maybe to force it to a different state to reset it um, or to make it solved for example um, and that's what I'm going to show you how to do by the end of this video. So I've deliberately chosen three different types of controllers here to show that um, what I'm going to explain to you is kind of totally agnostic of what platform you might be using it on but they're all what we call MQTT clients and uh, on my PC I've got an MQTT host running, uh, a broker and what that means is if I just turn uh, this window on so you can see what's happening here. So this is the uh, output from my host device and when any of these puzzles changes state what you'll be able to see is that they're publishing a message to that server um, so if I turn this one off and you'll see that the server is able to get a notification every time the state of one of these puzzles changes which is uh, very useful. Um, not only that but the host is able to publish messages itself which is received by these devices. Um, so if I put uh, an input window on like this and let's say I want to um, send a message to uh, reset uh, or maybe I want to force one of these devices to be solved. So let's say I want to send a message that forces the uh, Raspberry Pi puzzle to be solved. Um, what I can do is I can enter into this uh, command window here. Uh, so I'll do mosquito pub. So mosquito is the name of the MQTT uh, broker I'm using. Pub because I'm going to publish a message and then I'm going to send a topic um, which a topic is a way of uh, describing which device is going to listen to this message. So I'm going to send it to a particular device and I'm going to send it to the Raspberry Pi and then I can send uh, whatever message I want but the message I want to send in this case is going to be uh, no I was going to solve it wasn't I so let's solve the Raspberry Pi puzzle. So an operator could do this remotely and when I send that message you'll see the Raspberry Pi gets solved. Um, maybe instead of solving I want to reset it instead. So instead of that I'll keep the same topic so any of this device is listening um, but instead the message is going to be reset and that will turn it off. Um, now the great thing about MQTT is that you can set as many topics as you want and um, when the server publishes a message to a topic, it doesn't know or care um, which clients are listening. If there are any clients listening, it will just send that information out. And similarly, the clients can listen to topics without caring whether anything is publishing there at the time. So it's a very kind of ad hoc way of setting up an information network. Um, so all of these devices here, I've got listening to their own unique uh, topic at the moment. So let's say instead of the Raspberry Pi, I want to tell the Arduino to reset instead. I would simply send the topic of that message. Uh, now the Arduino is already um, reset actually, so let's set it to solve instead. Uh, so we'll change that message there to solve. 
you'll see the Arduino gets solved. Uh, now let's tell the Wemos to be solved. That one comes on. Uh, let's set the Raspberry Pi to be solved. You'll get the hang of this by now, hopefully, how this is working. Um, there we go, so I've got all three of my puzzles solved. Um, now a client can listen to as many different topics as it wants as well. So in addition to each of these listening to their own unique topic, um, I've also got them listening to a topic um, which is simply two device all, like that. So now I'm going to reset all the devices by sending a reset message to the two device all topic. And they all go off. Uh, and then finally, let's just uh, demonstrate that again by setting them all to solve. And they all come back on. So in that example, I was publishing messages from uh, the command line application on my PC, which is the same machine as I'm actually running the MQTT broker service itself. But that doesn't need to be the case. You can uh, publish messages from any device that's on your network, just as you can subscribe to uh, messages in different topics as well. So um, as an example of a different control application here, I've got a, a thing running on my uh, Android mobile phone. And you can see I've got six buttons set up there, and they correspond to the solve and reset messages that I just demonstrated for these three devices. So if I press this red button at the bottom here, that sends the reset command to the topic that this Arduino is listening to. And this green button will send the solve command. So what I've got there is a toggle which will reset and solve uh, this device here, which you can see by the relay turning on and off. Uh, likewise, the buttons in the middle line here correspond to the Wemos, um, which I can turn off or I can force to be solved. And I've got the one at the top here um, that will reset or solve the Raspberry Pi. And you can create as many different um, sort of commands as you want here. All they're doing is behind the scenes that corresponds to an MQTT message that is delivered to a particular topic. So I could add another line for reset all or solve all or maybe reset the devices in a particular room or solve the devices that were all linked in some way to part of a meta puzzle or something like that. And I've got myself a handheld uh, controller that I can carry around and, and activate the puzzles as I want. So let me show you how I've got these devices wired up. Um, so like I said, I've got uh, three different devices running the three different puzzles. Um, and I kind of did that deliberately just to show you a bit of variety. So uh, the simplest one in a sense is the uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, so the Raspberry Pi has an onboard um, Ethernet socket anyway. Um, so I'm using uh, that to connect to my um, server. Um, and then on this side, I'm using the GPIO pins. I've got uh, a five volt relay module, um, which is plugged into five volt uh, to ground, and then to uh, this socket here, which is the um, GPIO 14 um, on my Raspberry Pi. And then I've got a single uh, read switch, and that's going between uh, ground and um, another one of the GPIO pins. I'm using GPIO 4 for that. So, um, uh, as in an Arduino, I've got that set, that input pin set as a with a pull-up resistor activated. So when a magnet comes close to it, uh, it forces the uh, metal strips to make a contact. That connects it to ground, um, at which point that GPIO pin there then has a low signal reading to it. And when that happens, it activates the relay. So nice and simple, and uh, like I say, it's just got a standard uh, RJ45 cable connecting it via Ethernet to my um, server. Uh, then I'll show you the Arduino next. Um, so the Arduino does not have a built-in uh, Ethernet port by default, um, but you can get lots of different uh, shields available for it. So I'm using an Ethernet shield, which kind of just stacks on top of the pins of the original um, Arduino Uno, um, and uh, you can still access um, all of the uh, underlying input and output pins through the shield as well. So I've stacked the shield on top, and then I've got an Ethernet cable um, plugged into the socket here. Um, and then again, I've got a 5 volt relay module going to a 5 volt ground 
and to uh, a single signal pin, which I'm using uh, A1 for this. Um, it doesn't need to be an analog pin, but that's just on the right side of the board for me to use. And then uh, for the sensor part of this, I've got the uh, light dependent resistor here. Um, and I've got that and a regular resistor. So I'm creating a, a voltage divider here, um, supplying five volts in on this side, going across the light dependent resistor and then the normal resistor to ground on this side. And I'm taking a signal reading in the middle uh, via this green wire here that's going to the A0 pin. So I'm taking an analog reading of the uh, resistance at that point uh, between the two resistors and that's what I'm using to decide um, whether uh, the light dependent resistor has been covered up or not. That's exactly the same technique as I used in the, the cover up puzzle which I've shown in the past so I won't go into any more detail there. Um, and then the, uh, the third puzzle is uh, using this thing called a Wemos. Now I haven't used these before, um, I've only recently discovered them to be honest and actually they're pretty cool. So um, it's a board very similar to an Arduino um, in that it has a number of um, inputs and outputs um, and uh, you can control um, various devices, um, you know, exactly the same as an Arduino. You can program it using the same Arduino IDE as well. Um, the difference uh, uh, from it compared to a regular Arduino is that it actually comes with onboard Wi-Fi. Um, and they're ever so cheap, these units. Uh, they're well under five pounds, I think this was, this cost me. So to have inbuilt Wi-Fi with that is, is brilliant. They use a slightly different chip, whereas the uh, Arduino is powered by an 80 uh, tiny or an 80 mega chip, um, the Wemos is powered by an ESP8266 chip, um, which actually is the same chip that you'd have in a Wi-Fi shield on an Arduino anyway. So it's kind of like a cross between the Wi-Fi Arduino shield and an Arduino itself. Um, but uh, they're really they're really great devices actually. The only limiting factor I've found is that they don't have um, analog inputs or certainly they're very hard to access analog inputs. Um, so they're limited in that respect, but in terms of other respects, they're, they're pretty great. So uh, once again, I've got a five volt relay plugged into a five volt ground and a signal line which is going around here to pin two and then I've got my uh, RFID reader which is plugged in using an SPI interface so that's going to uh, the MOSI and the MISO lines um, and the clock and the select lines so again that's exactly the same setup as I showed um, in my uh, one of my earliest puzzles that I, I showed how to do using RFID for object placement. So uh, the hardware side of things is um, actually very straightforward for these three devices. So the MQTT broker service I'm using is something called Mosquito um, from Eclipse and you can uh, download it from mosquito.org. Uh, it's like Mosquito with two T's. I don't know if that's Mosquito, Mosquito, whatever. But anyway, uh, it's an open source um, and it's very good and it runs on lots of different operating systems. So if you go to the download site here, and I'm using, uh, I've got a Windows machine, so I'm using the Windows binary installation, but you can also build for Mac, uh, Linux, um, and various other um, systems here as well. You see, so there's lots of different builds available. Uh, if you do use the Windows um, installation as I do, um, once you've downloaded and installed it, you might find um, that there's a couple of dependencies required as well. Um, these are pretty easy to get. Um, so here's the setup screen once you download and try to install it. And uh, here you'll be told um, just two additional things to install. So it's OpenSSL and pthreads. And you simply click these links and download them to the uh, installation directory exactly as instructed. And then build will carry on as normal. OK, so here's what the um, directory looks like when Mosquito is finished being installed. Um, and there's uh, three programs which I'm going to sort of concentrate on. So the first one is this Mosquito uh, executable itself. And that is the main uh, MQTT broker service that we're going to um, run. Now, you can either double click it um, and 
load it straight from here. You can run it from command line, um, which is useful if you want to pass additional parameters into it, for example. Um, there is actually also a service that you can run, like a Windows service, um, which will run in the background uh, and you can start um, automatically every time your, your server starts. But just for the, the purposes of demonstrating here, I'll just do a simply double click that file here. And I'll get this blank command window here, uh, which I'll just drag into the corner. And that's just going to show the fact that the uh, MQTT broker is running uh, sort of in the background. It hasn't got anything to display at the moment, but so long as I keep that window open, um, that broker service is going to be running there. Okay. Uh, now, these are the other two uh, programs we're interested in. Um, this is a command line application for publishing messages. And this is a command line application for subscribing to messages. Um, so I'm going to load up a new command prompt. In fact, I'll load up two new command prompts, um, which I'm going to use to demonstrate how uh, they can be used to test our server. So in this window, um, the first thing I'm going to do is to subscribe to a topic. So I'm going to use the sub um, uh, application, and then I'm going to pass in the T parameter, which is the name of the topic that I want to subscribe to. So I'll just subscribe to topic to start with, hit enter, and leave that window running. And now in this command prompt, what I'm going to do is use the partner um, application, the pub command, to publish a message. I'm going to publish it into topic, which is what the other one is, is listening to. And the message I'm going to uh, send is, let's simply send a hello world message. Uh, hello world, there we go. And when I hit enter to send from uh, the publish application, you'll see that uh, this uh, window here, which is subscribed to that topic, uh, simply prints the message that was received. Now, if I were to send, uh, so let's just send a, 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 another message. So I'll say hello again, and you'll see that it echoes that there as well. Now, suppose I was to publish instead to uh, a different topic. Notice that this command still gets sent. I don't get any errors or, or anything like that. It's published it to a different topic, but because this client here is not listening to that topic, uh, nothing happens. So um, the way that I normally set my topics up, and I, I sort of briefly touched on this before, so I have each uh, device listens to a topic that is just intended for uh, messages to that device. Um, but then you can also set up um, other, as many different topics as you want, uh, maybe f to control um, devices in each room or for devices that all want to listen to a particular type of message, for example. Um, if I just cancel the subscription for a moment in this window and I'll start a new subscription instead. So I'm still listening to topic, but let's say I also want to listen to another topic. Um, so let's call topic two. And you can also put wildcards in it as well. So you can put um, topic and then a forward stroke and then let's put a hash symbol. And what that's going to say is that's going to listen to topic and any subtopics of topic. Um, so here, back in my uh, publisher window again, I can now publish to uh, topic stroke subtopic, for example. And the subscription appears in this window here because it's listening to the subtopics. It's listening to every subtopic, in fact. Uh, if I publish to subtopic two, I still get hello again. If I get subtopic two stroke sub subtopic stroke what now, those will get received. But if I publish to a subtopic of topic two, for example, uh, what we'll find is that, uh, let's change this message to um, a different message. This one does not get received because although I subscribe to the highest level of topic two, I haven't subscribed to subtopics of it. So it's a hierarchical structure and um, you can kind of set this up how you want to best kind of match the way that your devices are configured um, uh, you know, the, the, the way that you want to control them. Uh, this hash symbol is a, is a kind of a catch-all wildcard. You can also use a, a plus symbol, uh, which is a one-level wildcard only. 
Um, and through using a combination of them and also subscribing to, to many topics, you can get quite a, a good fine degree of control over um, which messages are received and acted upon by which client. So that's tested that the uh, server is running okay and that we can send and receive messages to it. So now let me show you the uh, code that's running on the uh, devices. So I'll start off with the Arduino, um, which has got the Ethernet shield attached to it and is running um, uh, the cover-up puzzle. So this is where you have to put your hand over the light-dependent resistor um, to activate the puzzle. Now this is a puzzle that I've um, shown in the past. Uh, this is a new and improved version with uh, added support for MQTT, but the vast majority of the main puzzle file has uh, remained unchanged. So I'm not really going to go through that in detail because uh, you can look at one of my earlier videos where I explain that. Uh, but all I'll do is show the bits that I've changed. So in this file, all this is the same, all this is the same. In the onSolve uh, callbacks, this is the function that gets called when the puzzle is solved, I've added uh, one new line here um, which calls this publish command and just sends a message to the host to say that the puzzle has been solved. And I've also got uh, a, a matching message here in the uh, un, un, on unsolve command even uh, that says that it's become unsolved. And I've got um, one in the reset uh, uh, callback as well to say whether it's been reset. So all these are just simple updates to inform the host of the current state of the puzzle. Uh, and then in the uh, setup function that's called when the program first runs, uh, I've got two new bits here. Obviously, uh, the MQTT service itself depends first on having connection to the network. Um, so I've got uh, a function here that sets up, uh, first of all, the Ethernet connection. And then when that's done, uh, I just call some additional functions to set up the MQTT service itself. Um, and then from then on, I'm pretty sure. Uh, oh no, there's one more bit here in the uh, loop function. Uh, just at the end of the loop, uh, there's a few additional commands need to be doing to uh, receive any messages that might be queued up uh, or to send messages as well. So I just call one uh, loop command in there. So that is all the changes to the main puzzle file. Um, in terms of where those functions are actually defined, so what does this publish do? What does Ethernet setup do? What does MQTT setup do? I've put them in uh, a separate file within the project directory. So um, as much as possible, you should try to sort of keep your code files, um, you know, easily reusable. So all this file here is is just specific to the puzzle. And then here's another file that's just placed in the same directory that could be reused across. Um, any puzzles which I wanted to um, convert to use this Ethernet connection MQTT. Uh, so what has this got in it? Okay, well, we start off with some um, includes, as always. So SPI and Ethernet are both inbuilt Arduino libraries. I'm using one third-party library, which is this thing called PubSub Client, and you can access it from this GitHub link here. And that's going to provide the uh, publishing and subscription services that we'll use. So download it from here and then you can um, install it into your uh, Arduino installation by uh, choosing this option here to add the zip library that you install. And we'll start off with defining some uh, constants required to um, make the Ethernet connection. So um, we need to know the MAC address, the unique hardware address of the network device. Uh, now, this might be printed on um, uh, a sticker that's attached to your uh, Ethernet shield. If not, you can uh, make a value, or you might well be able to use uh, this value here. Uh, it needs to be unique is the, is the, uh, the main thing to make sure it doesn't um, interfere with other devices that might be on your network. Um, now, here I'm assigning a uh, IP address to use in case DHCP doesn't assign a valid IP address. Now, whenever you're um, setting up anything that's kind of networked, uh, I highly encourage you to use static IP addressing. Um, so, 
DHCP, you know, when you just turn your laptop on in a Wi-Fi cafe or something like that, and you, you know, you get a different IP address, you just get a signed one, you don't normally need to worry about it, and that's pretty convenient. But um, when you're starting to kind of uh, write code that is going to be, um, you know, hard-coded what the IP address of a device that's going to be connected to a particular server or something like that, it's really frustrating if that kind of changes over time as new IP addresses are assigned. So, um, I'd really recommend you to, you know, your router or your, your modem might allow you to assign a particular um, address to give out via DHCP anyway, or you can assign it, um, you know, in code. But but I highly recommend having a static IP address for each of your devices. You will find it makes it much easier later on um, when you actually come to, to try to debug any errors and things like that as well. Um, here I'm declaring, this is the uh, IP address of my host machine. Um, my PC that's running the, the Mosquito service that I just showed you. And this is another bit that needs to be unique. So every device on your network needs to have a unique ID for communicating with the MQTT broker. Um, so I've just named this um, Arduino because I've got three different devices. So I'm just calling them what they are. You might want to append a random uh, string onto the end of that to make sure it's unique if you want. Or just make sure that you give each of your puzzles a unique name. Um, that will help identify them um, on the network later on. Okay, we set up some globals. So I'm uh, using the Ethernet client here that came with that Ethernet library declared at the top. And I'm creating uh, an instance of the pub sub client based on that Ethernet client. Um, I'm just going to hold a variable of when the last time a message was uh, published to the broker. And here I've got some uh, sort of buffers, which I'm just going to reuse every time I write a new message. Um, I'm going to first copy it into this variable here and to the topic I'm going to send here. Um, because uh, Arduinos and, and other sort of small embedded devices don't have a whole lot of memory available on them, um, you don't really want to be assigning memory dynamically each time you send a message. So what I'll just do is declare these once and then I'll reuse those same variables for every message that's sent. Um, this is a, a pulse count here, so often it's quite useful to publish a little um, kind of pulse or heartbeat message regularly from your device as well, just to inform the network that it's still on and still um, you know, connected. Uh, so that's just a counter which increments to say how many times it said, hello, I'm still here, I'm still turned on. Um, and then if you compare that to the pulses received at the server end, if any have been dropped, um, you, you know, it might be an indication that you need to kind of look at your network, see if there's some issues there. Okay, so this next uh, section here, uh, this is the uh, callback that is fired whenever a message is received on any of the topics that this device is listened to. So the callback uh, is given the topic in which the message was published, uh, it's given what's called the payload, so that's basically the content of the message itself, and it's told how long the message is. Um, now, you'll notice that payload is uh, delivered as a, um, a pointer to a byte, um, so to make it just a bit friendlier, um, because we're passing text strings as command, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is copy that into a um, character array. So we're going to use that uh, message. Remember I said we were going to reuse a message buffer at the top here, which is here. So we'll copy payload into that and we'll put a, a null terminator on the end, which is how you define a, a valid string. Um, we'll just print out some debug information to say that a message has been received. And then this is where we're going to define, these are all the different commands that uh, this device will react to. So we're using a string comparison function. Having copied the, the payload into this message, we can now do string comparisons. Um, it's not the only way to do this. You could decide to pass all your commands around as just integer um, you know, values. So if you pass the command you know, 1000, that would be a reset. 1001 is solved. 1002 is a, you know, report status or something, um, which would save you a little bit of memory. But I think for the sake of making your code more readable, um, I'd much rather actually see named uh, values that you're um, comparing to here. I just find that easier to do. So 
Uh, if we compare the message, if we compare the payload received to the string solve, and if stracomp returns zero, that means that they match. Uh, that means there's, basically there's no differences between the message and solved. So in that case, this is the string was received. We'll call the on solve um, callback. And that's exactly the same on solve callback uh, as it's going to be called if the puzzle is solved normally. It's just this one here um, that was already in the puzzle from the first time we wrote it. Um, likewise, if we compare the message received to the string reset and we find that they're exactly the same, there's no differences, we'll call the on reset callback instead, uh, which is also defined in this file here. So all we're saying is have a look when the message is received. Uh, if it is one of these, we'll act just the same as if the uh, uh, the message had been uh, if the puzzle had been solved or reset normally. Okay, uh, this next section here. So this is specific to um, using the Ethernet uh, shield or an Ethernet connection. Uh, so we'll uh, and it and it just creates the network connection in the first place. So we'll start the serial. Uh, link if there hasn't already been a serial link set up, which there might have been um, from earlier on in the setup procedure. Um, we'll just print a little bit of debug information. And then we'll first try um, to connect just using the MAC address. Uh, and if that fails, then we'll begin, uh, we'll try to begin an Ethernet connection instead using the MAC address and the IP that we gave at the top. So this is, uh, if you want, uh, I said not to use DHCP, but, but this is, I'm assuming that your um, router is assigning a fixed IP address based on uh, the uh, based on the MAC address there. If it doesn't, then this is kind of telling the device to assign itself a static IP address. Um, that's kind of, you know, depends on how your network is, is configured as to exactly how, how you want that set up. Um, we'll just uh, wait a couple of seconds. I found that this is helpful even when uh, this returns and kind of says that the network's ready. Sometimes I find that it just helps to have a little bit of a delay before you try to start um, using it. So it's just a two second delay. And then we'll say uh, that we're connected and we'll also just use this uh, ethernet.local IP. We'll dump that to the serial output um, just so that we can get some kind of useful debugging information. Uh, this is MQTT setup, so this is called immediately after Ethernet setup. Um, uh, so in the setup function at the beginning of the script, we'll connect to the network, we'll set um, the server to MQTT server IP and we'll use that port 1883, that's the default port number for the MQTT service, and we'll assign the callback that we've just uh, looked through. So here is MQTT callback just up here. Okay. And then the final, or the nearly final function, the MQTT loop. So this was called um, from the main uh, program loop itself. It was just this bit that was added here. So on every iteration through the program loop, first of all, um, we make sure that we're still connected to the MQTT client. If we're not, what we'll try and do is attempt a, a reconnection. Um, so uh, we'll connect using the device ID so that um, remember I said that you needed a unique device ID uh, this one's just called Arduino we'll try to collect the client using that and if we do achieve a um, successful connection we're going to publish something to uh, the topic called to host and then we're going to publish to a subtopic of that uh, which is this device ID so this uh, script here is going to publish a message to uh, to host and then the subtopic is going to be called Arduino. So just from looking at the topic in which this message is published I actually know um, where it's come from. Now if you wanted to you could write uh, the um, the device ID, the Arduino, in the message payload itself. Instead of adding it to a topic there you could put it as part of the message. Um, it doesn't really matter um, I find that the, the structured hierarchy of the topics like this is quite a good way to uh, pass information between clients 
Um, but if you wanted to, you could just put it in the to host topic and include the device ID somewhere else. But all it says is that um, this device has connected to the network and we'll publish that topic there. Then we'll subscribe to the topics that we're interested in. And there's two topics that we're interested in. The first one, our message is meant only for this device. And so they're going to go to a topic called to device and then the ID of this device particularly. And we'll also subscribe to messages that are meant to every device. So we'll subscribe to the all subtopic of the to device topic. Finally, we'll, uh, oh sorry, if this, so this else here uh, corresponds to the if here. So if we couldn't connect the MQTT client on this time round, uh, we'll just, we'll dump the uh, failure message here. We'll wait five seconds and then we'll try again. So this is just kind of a reconnect loop just to, to make sure if anything goes wrong with the network, we'll automatically try to reconnect. Um, and then finally at the bottom, um, in fact, I've scrolled slightly off the screen. So let me just try and um, bring that back up. Uh, we'll see this uh, publish um, message here. Uh, so this is uh, what was being called in my on solve and my um, on reset and my on unsolve messages. So this publish here, cover up puzzle reset, uh, that calls this function here. And what this simply says is it uh, copies to the topic variable. Again, we're sending it to the host. And again, we're copying in this device's ID into the subtopic that we're publishing to. So the host knows where this message has come from. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to publish the message that was sent. So either that the puzzle was reset, that it was solved, etc. And we're going to publish it uh, to the host. And that's the whole of the script. So we've got very few changes to the main uh, puzzle script. This is nearly identical to the very first one I published with the exception of a few uh, additions here, uh, a few additions to the end of setup just to set up the Ethernet and the MQTT and then at the end of the loop function we just call the extra loop uh, required for the MQTT functions. And then this additional file contains mostly uh, simple stuff to, to set up the network itself and the actual process of um, acting on messages that are received that are subscribed to is mainly done in this bit here. Um, and it's just a case of comparing to the string and calling a function of what you want to happen. Uh, and for subscribing, oh, and for publishing, sorry, uh, it is um, just this function at the bottom here. And that's about it. So this is the script that's running on the uh, Wemos device. And uh, as you'll see, I've structured it in almost exactly the same as I had before. So in this code file here, this is basically the same as the code I showed for my RFID object placement puzzle. Uh, this is all identical. The only difference is I'm only using uh, one RFID reader in this example. Um, I mean, I could put four in there um, or however many you want really. But what I'm trying to demonstrate really is, is the MQTT bit rather than the RFID bit. So I just put one there. This is all identical. This is all identical. Uh, again, just as in the other example, I'm calling extra setup functions at the end of the setup loop. But rather than Ethernet setup this time, uh, I'm calling Wi-Fi setup um, because the Wemos device uh, obviously uses wireless connection rather than a wired connection. And uh, everything the same. This is all the same as in the original RFID puzzle. Uh, this is all the same. Once again, at the end of the loop function, I call MQTT loop. Um, in the solve function here, I publish a message. And the same in uh, unsolve and the same in uh, reset. So um, this is exactly uh, the same process as I did before. I've just added a few new lines into the main puzzle sketch. But then alongside it, I have um, a new uh, file, which is in the, the, the same uh, directory of the project. Um, so for this example here, now this is almost identical. If you're using um, uh, a Wemos like me, or if you're using an Arduino with a Wi-Fi shield, it's almost identical. The only difference is this very first library here. Um, you'll see I'm using the ESP8266 
8266 Wi-Fi library. If you're just using um, uh, an Arduino Wi-Fi, I think I'm right in saying you'd simply replace that just with uh, Wi-Fi instead. Uh, the library functions themselves are exactly the same um, uh, matched together, so you don't need to make any other changes. So how does this work? Well, this one is very similar to the, uh, the Ethernet um, library. Um, it's just there's a few minor differences um, uh, because of the Wi-Fi connection. So uh, rather than defining a MAC address um, at the beginning here, what I'm defining is the uh, SSID and password required to access my Wi-Fi connection. Um, don't worry, I've since changed this since creating these videos, so I'm not worried about anyone jumping on getting free Wi-Fi from me. Um, again, I define the IP address of my PC that's running the MQTT broker service, and I define a unique ID. Remember, my last one was called Arduino. Uh, this one's called WeMOSD1 because that's the, the name of the board that's running it. And uh, this is all very similar to before. Rather than having an Ethernet client, I have a Wi-Fi client here. And then when I create my instance of the pub sub client, I'm pointing it to the Wi-Fi client I've just created rather than pointing it to the Ethernet client. But other than that, that's uh, the same. Uh, these are all exactly the same. The MQTT callback is also exactly the same as with the Ethernet example. So I'm just comparing the message to either solve or reset. Obviously, you can add as many other commands as you want um, here to, to respond to, but I'm just using solve and reset for now. Uh, this bit's slightly different because the nature of setting up a Wi-Fi connection is slightly different to a wired Ethernet connection. Um, so again, we'll start a serial connection if there isn't one already. We call wifi.begin and uh, we pass in the ID and the password required to access the network. If you're trying to connect to an open network with no authentication, um, you can just delete these and connect like that. Uh, and then we'll wait a little bit uh, to, to wait for the Wi-Fi connection to uh, become active. We'll just enter a little loop here, um, which will just print some dots onto the screen while we're waiting to get that status code to let us know that the Wi-Fi has been connected. Again, once it has been connected, we'll just put a two second delay. Uh, I find that helps just stabilize the, um, the hardware a little bit before we try to use it. And then we'll print the local IP address that's been assigned to us. Um, MQTT setup, which is called immediately after that, has remained exactly the same as in the ethernet example. And the MQTT uh, loop is also um, exactly the same as it was before. Um, because the MQTT client we're using exactly the same one as in the Ethernet example. The only difference is that right at the top here, um, we were creating the instance of that client based on a Wi-Fi client rather than based on an Ethernet client. But other than that, it's exactly the same. Um, and then at the end of the uh, file here, we've just defined that um, published message. So, you know, 90% of this file, if you're using a Wi-Fi connection, is the same as if you were using uh, an Ethernet connection. Um, the only difference is slightly is, is in the initial setup of how the network is connected. Uh, so that's the, uh, the Wemos code. And now let me show you the uh, Raspberry Pi code. So I haven't actually shown any Raspberry uh, Pi code before now, I don't think. I think it's the first time I've done it. So I'm using the uh, Nano um, uh, editor on the Raspberry Pi itself. So I've connected to my Pi via um, PuTTY and then I'm using the Nano editor to actually edit the file on the Pi itself. Um, so it's basically a similar structure to how you've seen in the Arduino examples though. So we start off by importing any libraries we use. Um, I'm using uh, something called the Paho or Paho um, client um, which you can uh, install using uh, pip if you're familiar installing um, packages on your Raspberry Pi, um, you can get it from there. I'm also using the uh, built-in uh, GPIO library to access the uh, pins that control the relay. Um, and I'm importing the inbuilt time library as well. Um, I'm going to use that because I'll sleep. I'll make the application uh, pause for a little bit using sleep. Uh, so just as with Arduino, we begin with the setup. Um, we'll set the mode of how we're going to access the GPIO pins. I will also just turn warnings off. 
next we'll configure the pins um, so uh, 14 is going to be the pin that's connected to the relay uh, and then pin 4 is the one that's going to read whether the read switch has been activated or not um, and then I've got so unlike in the Arduino sketch uh, because I haven't shown this file before I've actually merged both the puzzle control and the uh, network and MQTT control sort of into one uh, file in this example so up to now we've been looking at setting up um, the puzzle now we're looking at setting up the MQTT bit so here's the callback uh, when the MQTT client becomes connected uh, we'll print a message to the screen and then we'll use this uh, subscribe method here we'll subscribe to the device all channel and we'll also subscribe to the uh, the topic just intended for this uh, device uh, so the the all topic and also the device specific topic uh, on message this is going to be um, called when uh, any message is published to a topic that we subscribe to so when it's published to either that all topic or the raspberry pi topic um, and exactly as with the Arduino again, what we're going to do is compare the payload of the message to the string solve or to the string reset. And depending on which one of those it is, we're just going to set the state of the puzzle into one of two states, one or zero. Uh, here we have um, another callback. This is just this is kind of just tidying up a little bit. So uh, if the client becomes disconnected, will stop calling the the mqtt loop that's all that says uh, a few global variables just to keep track of the puzzle itself uh, so what was the input in the last frame what was the state before the current one and what is the current state as well um, and we'll just create those all as integers just to keep track of them okay so here is where we set up uh, the um, client itself so this is the the paho client um, so we'll create a new instance of the mqtt client We'll assign those three callbacks that we actually declared above. And then we use the connect method. Uh, here's the IP address of my server that's running the broker and the port number. Uh, and then we'll use loop start to start the uh, update loop. So this runs in a separate thread in the background and we'll just take charge of delivering messages and um, informing the application if any messages have been published in any topics we've been subscribed. And then we'll just set up a, a, a main program loop here. So we'll carry on running indefinitely through this loop. We'll read the input on uh, pin four. So that's the pin that has the read switch attached to it. Um, if we were previously reading a high signal on that pin, but now we're reading a low signal, that means that a uh, magnet has been held near the read switch this frame and it wasn't there before. So we'll use that as our signal to toggle the state of the program between one and zero. We'll update our previous stored uh, input. And if this state is different from the one that we knew about before, um, so we know that the puzzle has changed, if it's now become unsolved, uh, we'll use the publish method to tell the host and we'll again, we'll send our ID, so the idea of this puzzle will send as a subtopic to the host so it knows where it's come from and we'll just know that the read switch puzzle has been reset uh, and we'll also activate the relay obviously um, and or the alternative is the state is now one and it wasn't before that means that the puzzle has been solved so we'll send a message to say the puzzle has been solved and uh, send a low signal to the relay finally we'll update the previous state sleep for um, you know tenth of a second and then we'll just keep on looping round and round that loop and the final program I need to show you how to set up was the uh, Android application which I demonstrated earlier um, so this is a program called MQTT Dash um, which you can get on the Google Play Store um, I'm sure there are equivalent programs that you can get for iPads and iPhones as well um, but I use Android so this is the one I use um, it's really straightforward you simply download it once you've installed it um, and follow the instructions you first set up a connection to your uh, broker um, so this screen here you say you can actually have multiple MQTT servers that you connect to but you can just define only one if you want and then having uh, created a connection to the 
uh, correct broker, you can then define any number of uh, messages and the message will be sent to a particular topic. So this one here, you can see door forward stroke lock. Um, and then you can get the message itself. So the payload here is on is one and off is zero. Um, but in the examples that I've been uh, sort of demonstrating, um, on would be solve and off will be reset. So you can simply type any uh, text string or number you want in the payload of um, the message to send and you set the topic uh, to be sent to the host um, and then you then you end up with just uh, the buttons on your screen that you can press to send that message. So it's uh, it's very simple to, to use and, and set up that one and there's instructions online as well. So that was a very brief introduction to MQTT. It's a great, really simple, lightweight system that you can use to send uh, all sorts of sensor information and simple instructions uh, on an ad hoc network between devices. So it's really, really useful for kind of escape room type scenarios. Um, if you've got any questions uh, about anything I've said, please feel free to ask in the comments and I'll include uh, some more uh, notes in the description there about um, more documentation and things that you might want to refer to. Um, I mean, obviously the next uh, stage, if you wanted to take this further, is to uh, put a slightly nicer uh, GUI front end maybe on the server application. So rather than writing command lines, um, you could get like a nice front end that showed you a, a graphical look at what the state of each puzzle was at the moment. Um, I might do that in a future video if uh, people are interested. Um, but I hope you enjoyed watching this video and uh, thanks very much for watching.